Hello, good morning, everyone, and welcome to this webinar with the Spain-U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Uh, we are uh, really happy to host uh, today uh, Pere Francino with us to talk about powering tomorrow and EV charging solutions for condos and businesses. But before I introduce our uh, guest speaker today and, and the topic, I just would like to remind everyone that uh, the Spain-U.S. Chamber of Commerce um, host webinars like this um, usually every two weeks and you are able to find all those webinars in our YouTube channel. So we have been addressing different topics that I'm sure that will be very interesting for you. Um, so please check it out in our YouTube channel, all the webinars that we've been doing for the last two years, because I'm sure there probably will be some topics of your interest. Um, apart from that, uh, from the Spain-US Chamber of Commerce, we welcome everyone interested in participating in our events, not only the webinars, but also the in-person events that we host um, every month. So check our website, which is www dot spainuschamber.com uh, for all the activities that we host at the chamber and, and join us. So we encourage everyone to join the activities that we host and network with other companies and uh, like-minded uh, individuals. Uh, for today's webinar, as always, uh, we will share the presentation at the end of the webinar with all the attendees so that you can take a look in more detail to the information that it's going to be addressed today. And we will also share the, the recorder session. This video uh, will be recorded and it will be shared with all the attendees and also uploaded to our YouTube channel. And as always, uh, you're welcome also to share your thoughts and send questions for our guest speakers. So we will address all the questions uh, at the end of the presentation, but you are able to send your questions during the whole time. You don't need to wait until the end to send your questions. And to do that, you just need to click on the question tab that you will find in the control panel, probably in the right side of your screen right now. There should be a control panel with a tab that says questions or maybe preguntas, if it's set up in Spanish, click there, write your question, send it to us, send it to us, and we will take care of all the questions at the end of the presentation. And now without further ado, let me introduce you uh, Citi Vitae and Pere Frantino. So for those that are not aware about Citi Vitae, uh, it's a company that excels in simplifying the procurement and administration of electric vehicle charging stations. They serve a diverse range of settings, such as shopping centers, residential complex, office buildings, and condos. And their collection of electric vehicle charging solutions and products combines industry-leading technology with the highest quality charging hardware. This includes acquisition and investment programs, advanced revenue management software, maximal utilization of available electrical capacity, and cutting edge location technology. So it's it's a real uh, great partner uh, in order to set up electric vehicle charging stations. And we have today uh, Pere Franzino, which is the CEO and founder of CDVTI, a rapidly growing EV charging operator in Florida. Prior to this, he accumulated over 20 years of experience in the mobility and transportation sector. Uh, he serves as an expert evaluator for the European Union and having lived in five countries, Pedro takes pride in holding three passports as a tangible sign of his appreciation for diversity. Urban mobility has been his passion ever since he discovered its powerful impact on boosting economic development in different regions. And electric mobility is not an exception. So welcome, Pere. Thank you very much, uh, Juan Carlos. Uh, thank you to uh, the Spain-US Chamber of Commerce for organizing this uh, this webinar about um, electromobility. Um, and let me uh, jump into the a little bit of outline of what we are going to learn today. We are going to talk about this is what what I like to what I like to call the electromobility 1.0. 
Um, but we hopefully the target we have is that at the end of the presentation, everybody will have a much better knowledge of what's the state of the art and most importantly, how to introduce electromobility um, into the business or into their condos, into their multifamily units. So after talking about the, uh, a little bit of the EV charging landscape, we will get an idea on uh, some technical and operational aspects of this. Also, we will speak about um, regulation and compliance. Um, what can we do, what, what we cannot do about uh, installing um, EV charging stations in our residence or in our office. Um, and then uh, we will also get a touch on uh, what are the best practices and what are the cost uh, implications of, of, of electromobility. So the first thing is um, electromobility is not only Tesla, even if they have a, a, a very big uh, market share, um, a lot of brands uh, are very, very fast uh, running into uh, developing uh, their own uh, product line of uh, electric vehicle char electric, ve electric vehicles, and consequently, the EV charging market is more and more important. Um, and as I said, we will focus today in um, two areas, the multi-residential and, and the commercial uh, properties. So the first thing um, it's worth mentioning is that the market um, taking um, any uh, precaution, uh, I am not the type of person that I like to be like uh, blowing castles uh, in the air, but today it's more and more clear that in uh, uh, the, about the, the growth figures um, and uh, for instance, uh, the pace of growth uh, during the during the year 2023, um, every uh, minute there was a new registration certificate for an EV uh, issued in US. Um, so post COVID, we have already reached um, the growth that we had before COVID. Um, today, um, we are expecting that the percentage of new car sales in 2030, which is very much next door in six or seven years, um, three out of 10 cars that are being sold in US, which is about 1 million per month. Um, three out of 10, 30, a little bit more than 33% in 2030 will be electric. Um, today, we have a little bit over 50,000 uh, charging stations in the public space, um, and we are expecting to need about 1.5 million in uh, the year 2030. What is very important to understand the EV market is that even if the growth is very big, it's very impressive, um, the baseline, um, the underlying market is, is still huge. We are talking about um, US has a fleet of 250 million cars, which is approximately a 25%, a quarter of the a global world fleet. Um, uh, holding uh, Europe about 300 um, uh, million, and then another 300 million for um, China, and then the rest is spread a little bit all over. So out of these 250 million um, uh, cars, uh, the fleet is still very little in the same way that even if we are selling um, a lot month by month, but still it's a long way to go before we reach uh, the 1 million um, 1 million sales per, per year. So when we look at the, um, the line in black, that's the percentage of registrations, um, which is about um, 20%, and the percentage of sales is about 30%, right? So again, the market is, is growing very fast, but we are not at all um, in a majority and, and, and what we are doing is to, to manage that growth in the most important part for us, which is all the EV charging infrastructure that we will need for, um, to, to tackle, to cope with that, with that uh, increasing um, electric vehicle fleet. So one of the big questions uh, that everybody says is how long does it take to charge your car? So again, we are going into Electromobility 1.0. Um, so in order to know that question, 
uh, we need to talk about the charger itself, we need to talk about the battery capacity, and we need to talk about the outlet, right? So the question on how, how long it takes to charge your car, it's very much depending on those uh, factors. And um, super important to understand that every car has two circuits uh, to charge. One, what we call the level two or level one charging circuit, which is the one that we are depicting on the left, um, that's alternate current. And then um, the problem is that the battery, as many of you probably know, the battery doesn't speak alternate current. The battery only speaks direct current. Um, so somebody has to convert. Um, the, the power that we are collecting from the grid, that's always alternate current. So the decision and the different methodology for charging is either we are converting on the charger um, and then we are delivering direct current to the car, which is the level three on the right, or we leave the car to convert and we inject the car alternate current and the car converts before going into the battery. A lot of people think that level two, level three, it's something to do with the power. Strictly speaking, that has nothing to do with the power. Level two is alternate current that is being converted inside the car before it goes to the battery. Level three means that the charger itself is converting and the differences are important because um, when we talk about level three on the right, we are talking about, this is also called supercharger or fast charger. We are delivering direct current converted into the car and that the cost, the price of those charging stations starts around $20,000 per parking space. Um, and then when we are delivering alternate current, because we are not converting, the price of the charger is much more affordable. We are talking on the, uh, on the verge of uh, $3,000. Um, if we're talking about level one, that's pretty much the same as the level two, except that it has no communication line um, over the court. So level two and level three, there is power and there is communication going back and forth between the car and the charging station to um, allow us for this communication to handle and to manage that charging process. In the level two is the charging station, is the charging portable that you have in your trunk that you connect to the outlet of, uh, your, of your house, right? So an order of magnitude um, is that when we use a level three um, of a 40 amps, for instance, we could charge in about two hours, but we have installed charging stations that could charge in about 20 minutes, 10 minutes. The order of magnitude is more minutes than hours. And when we charge in a level two, we're talking about um, six, eight, four hours and level one, 15 to 20 hours. Um, that's the biggest. Uh, that's the biggest difference. But again, um, the fact that uh, it's level two or level three is not is not a direct consequence or cause of charging faster or slower. Or the the fact is that when we have the capacity to connect directly, a level three means that we have direct current, and in that case, uh, we can connect directly to the battery, and there is no interference with the um, onboard uh, converter. Um, that is normally the limiting factor uh, for the charging speed. So if I go directly with the level three into the battery, I have no limiting factor. I can deliver to the car as much as I want. And, and I can deliver very, very fast charging stations, like uh, 10, 15 minutes. But obviously, the cost, it goes much higher, right? So we start very, very basic level three charging station. It would be $20,000 when the other one is about $3,000. So this is not only particular from CTV I would say that this is the normal global practice in the market. This is what you can expect in terms of the answering the question of who pays for what in the charging uh, EV charging market, right? Let's start with the model on the right, um, which is the most, I would say, most traditional, more simple, uh, the complex uh, residential or uh, commercial or office building uh, purchases the charging station. So the host pays um, the charger and they pay a very small network fee to operate that charger on our platform. And uh, the revenue from the driver goes, as a principle, goes to the owner of the charging station, right? So this is what we have to bear in mind. Who pays for what? So the one who keeps the ownership of the charging station keeps the whole 
or most of the revenue coming from the driver. That's, again, that's traditional, that's standard. It's a purchasing uh, transaction and the host operates that charging station on our platform, on our network, and our network gives the capacity to manage, to handle, to, de to decide the charging rate and to decide who is going to charge for how long and all that, all that stuff is going to be decided in our platform. Um, and the platform fee it covers that expense um, to, for the complex, for the, for the office or for the multifamily unit to handle um, that amenity. Then there's another uh, basic business model, which I call vending machine, because that's what we are more used. It's um, in multifamily units. Uh, it's the same business model that we use for washing machines or for um, a Coke machine, for drinking, for colas, or where a company installs the machine, owns the machine, and keeps most of the revenue coming from that machine. So we also do that with charging stations. Um, the complex or the office building, the multifamily unit says, listen, I don't mind not to have the revenue as long as I can reduce the capital expenditure uh, from this amenity. So in that case, we go through an evaluation process and if the uh, complex applies, uh, qualifies for that vending machine model, obviously there needs to be some demand um, remember about the percentages that we were talking about. So today we are talking about five, ten percent of adoption, and sometimes in some residences, in some office buildings, it's even lower. So in that case, it could be that we cannot qualify for that vending machine because there is not sufficient demand as of today, perhaps in the future. But in any case, in the model of the left, um, the basic principle is that we, Citivitae, owns the machine, and we keep. Um, the totality of the revenue coming from the driver, or at least um, the most important part of it. Um, we are talking about potential of sharing also part of this revenue, and a lot of mixed models that are a little bit in between the two, right? But the two basic models that you can expect from the market are always a pure play from those two or a mix of those two. And that is, that's to answer to the question of who pays what. There's another important question, uh, especially for those living in multifamily units. There's close to two million condos um, in Florida. That's a, that's a that's a particularity of this state. Um, a lot of people, a big percentage of people, lives in multifamily units. Uh, when we are talking about condos, we are not talking about high scrappers only. We are talking about uh, residential properties with a common area, with a common space, um, and that there is approximately two million. Um, uh, two million of those um, uh, in in uh, in Florida. So, and the question that we could be uh, discussing is whether we um, we want to allow for individual parking spaces to install their own charging station, or on the contrary, we could handle um, a common area, a guest parking space, to install a charging station. And so that in that common area, a lot of people can go there, park, charge, and move away and go back to their own parking space. That is the solution that we are implementing for most of the multifamily units, uh, rather than installing in the individual parking space. Uh, and the answer is, it is very expensive uh, to install an infrastructure for some buildings that like have 200, 300 um, units. Imagine what it would cost to put an infrastructure to hook 300 charging stations, not only in terms of the capacity of the building, that, that's, that's one of the biggest problems, but not only in terms of that, but also in terms of uh, putting the conduits and the wiring, as we will see in a minute, uh, that's the biggest part of the um, investment that you will do in an EV charging uh, project. Uh, so it's really not practical, it's really not convenient um, to put in the individual parking space. However, it's convenient for the individual right? Uh, some people prefer to have that in their individual parking space because they don't want to go through the hassle of having to share uh, some common area. Well, the thing is, um, in the common area is also possible to handle, we have a lot of technology that can handle people coming in and out from the parking space, um, like, uh, uh, for instance, we charge per unit of energy, and when the battery is full, 
then we switch and we charge per parking space hour per use of the parking space. So what we have to keep, what we have to uh, retain here is that um, installing in a common area it's something that is doable, that we have the technology and it's much more efficient. Why? Because when you install a breaker, um, the, when you install your individual charging station in your own parking space, um, whether you use that capacity or not, that has been captured. That's super important to understand that the energy that has been assigned to your parking space, that energy is captured from the utility company, whether you use it or not, right? So that reduces the total capacity of the building to deliver charging services to the rest of the building. Today, on average, with about two or three charging stations, we can handle about 25 to 30 drivers. Uh, some people are surprised when we say that. The reason is because when you are charging, you are charging for 200 miles or 300 miles. And the average distance that you drive is much less than that. So normally, when we see a driver in our charging stations, we don't see them again in about seven to 10 days. So that's the reason why um, this proportion of efficiency and with about 20, uh, with, with two charging stations, we can handle we can handle 20 to 30 uh, drivers. Let's talk about uh, some um, installation examples and some uh, costs, or also uh, examples of the different um, of the different uh, projects. And don't forget that you can, while we are um, talking, um, you can put your questions. Um, you can raise your 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 questions, and we will be the we will be handling those um, at the end of the uh, presentation. So this is a this is an installation that we've done in Seventh uh, Avenue um, with uh, a building that is um, having a, an electrical room, two floors up. Um, so that means that from the parking space that you see up to the electrical room, there's two levels. That's one of the most important cost drivers. We are using about uh, 300 feet conduit um, times three, because there are three wires, 900 feet of wire. Um, and we are running uh, permits and engineering. It's Everything is indoors. So that means that we can uh, bring, we can run the conduit across the ceiling. Uh, we don't need to do trenching. We don't need to do uh, asphalt. Um, so the, an installation like that could cost you uh, around fifteen thousand dollars without the charging stations, right? So in this case, uh, installation of one level, uh, one level two, and one level three charger, it cost the level two. You can see it also here. You, it cost uh, fifteen thousand uh, dollars, right? It, the, the price. These prices could vary substantially depending on other factors. So the intention of that is, is really to give you an order of magnitude so that you are um, better fit with a, a good information on what could be the amount, uh, the effort, financial effort that the building could be could be doing. This is another installation in Boca. Um, this is outdoors. So we have to run the conduit um, underground here on trenching. We have to we have to run the conduit there um, on the on the grass, on the dirt. And, and there is uh, the reason why there is 600 feet of wire is because there are three um, uh, charging stations. Um, in this case, the distance is shorter, is 100 feet between the electrical room and the charging station that you can see. And so permits, including permits and engineering, this installation cost $11,000. So finally, um, this is um, this is about um, four, four level two uh, chargers on, on two dual pedestals. I, it's very much similar to the to the first one, but instead of uh, um, instead of being only two units, it's four units. And in this case, uh, the installation was also running on the ceiling um, indoors. And on that uh, 300 feet of conduit, the cost of this is about $12,000. This is another example, a uh, very short distance and very easy trenching. The electrical room is actually uh, is very, very close to this shopping center in Sunrise, and it's below $10,000. So I would say that 
I would say that we should be prepared if there is no asphalt, there is no boring, there is no big infrastructure, there is no big concrete work, um, even if it's a very large, very wide uh, order of magnitude, I would say on the vicinity of $10,000, between $10,000 to $20,000, depending on whether you're installing one, two or three, and depending on what is the distance, and that's the key parameter. So the key takeaway from this section of the presentation is where do you need to install the charging station? Well, don't be too imaginative. Uh, the first thing that you need to look at is where is your electrical room? From your electrical room, look at the parking space that is closer to that electrical room. Because that's going to be, um, as you remember, the charging stations, we're talking about $3,000. Um, the biggest part of the, of the infrastructure project, of the, um, of the amenity project, is going to be the infrastructure, right? So go as close as possible to the electrical room. Let me tell you a, a little bit about um, what's the current status of the Florida law. Um, the association cannot prohibit installation in limited common elements, parking space, or exclusively designated parking area. Um, and I'm not going to ask you to, to read all that. Um, it will be shared with the slides. But there's three things you need to, um, in multifamily units, in a residential um, a, a environment, there's three things you need to look at that the individual is paying the cost of the infrastructure, number one, that this is done with compliance with the Florida law in terms of having a certified installer, and that there is no uh, substantial modification of the uh, common area installation, right? So if the individual uh, driver um, complies with those three, they are free, and they are not only free, but you cannot prohibit the installation in that common element parking space. There was a modification of this law in, uh, at the beginning of 2023 because some people said, okay, this is on DD parking spaces, um, but if this is uh, uh, a sign, this is going to be the same, right? So some people thought that, or some people used the law, it was very explicit to say that if the parking space is did it, that is my own, I am the owner of the parking space, then I can do whatever I want. But this is also the case for assigned parking spaces, parking spaces that are not your ownership, that belong to the association, and the association can handle those in the way they want, right? So, so even in those case, cases where the parking space is assigned, the law applies, which means that you cannot prohibit as long as those three elements are in place. You have to install and pay for the installation. You have to do that in according to the electrical code. And you cannot make a substantial modification of the infrastructure, which is not the case uh, when you run a conduit and a wire normally, right? So this creates a situation where in a lot of properties, um, the, the association thinks, well, I don't want to install an EV charging station for somebody who drives an electric car um, because I don't, I don't want to have a gas station in my residence, right? So every, everyone pays the gas on its own and I don't want to, I don't want to incur in those costs, right? So um, there is a situation that is created between boards and residents um, and my advice is always to take a more cooperative um, uh, discussion rather than uh, confrontation, um, as many things in life. But what we are encountering every day, so it's hardly every, there's no two weeks, uh, every two weeks uh, I, I have to be part of a board meeting where I try to install, where I try to um, uh, explain what are the pros, what are the cons, and what are the technical solutions to make those these two walls converge? The world of, I don't care, electrical vehicles, and that's not my world, and I, I will never buy an electric car, which there are still people who do that, and boards who think that there's an, that there's an added value for their residents or for their business or for their office center to install that, right? So I would say that... Um, we we have three uh, I have three advices three uh, rules that I would like you to 
to take into account. So the first one is think big, but don't panic. So as an association manager or as a property, as an owner of an office, in an office center or someone responsible to give, to prepare that amenity to your team, um, think, think, think about the future, but don't panic because there's a lot to do. There's 250 million cars running in the, in the outer world. And, um, and we are very far away from having a 30, 40% adoption, but definitely the, the more you plan ahead, the better it's going to happen. I have seen a lot of buildings where they wait to the last minute. And if the drivers do things faster, then what happens? And I have very impressive pictures of condos in Southeast Florida where there is all conduits running all over because the, the resident has decided to install on their own, following the rules, doing the permits, and then it's unmanageable. It's legal, but it's in, unmanageable, right? There's conduits and wires all over, and there's no way that the association can do anything against. So it's better if we plan ahead. And, um, and uh, that's why a partnership, um, rather than a transactional vendor, and, and that's where CTVTI is positioning itself, as as a, for us the charging station is a byproduct of what we do which is to 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 provide a system right so the first thing and and very frequently we tell our clients you don't need five or you don't need six you only need two because there's a lot of um, misconceptions about um about the system and how to make it happen and how to make it work right so that's a little bit of a summary of those uh, three elements that are important I think short term, um, uh, uh, lay the ground for the long term, right? So um, what we do a lot, for instance, is that we are pulling wires and running conduit for for two, but we leave the space for five or six because we know that uh, growing at 30 to 40 percent, um, we are going to be in need uh, very soon of additional um, infrastructure, right? Um, a last message is you will have a lot of questions uh, when you take this decision to um, install EV chargers in your office center, in your multifamily unit, in your business. But technology can really handle almost everything. Virtually every question that you can have, technology can fix, right? Um, a good example is I have only two parking spaces, but 20 EV drivers, right? So, so I have we have spoken about that today technology can give you the potential to handle a lot of a lot of things with only a couple of parking spaces right and then to plan for the future to see what we are going to do um, so technology also gives you full visibility so some people say okay how how do i know that you're going to send us uh, the money of the transaction some very domestic questions so every time that you install a system from from us um, you get a private url where you have full visibility on on the dashboard and um, and you, you you know exactly who is charging when for how much um, and you have all you have all that right that that's um that's that's an answer that technology gives we have some uh, some situations where i want i want i ask my 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 uh, client, do you want to have the same charging rate for everyone, right? So, for instance, we have some clinics um, where we have a rate for the doctors and another one for the patients and another one for passersby, right? So, imagine that in a clinic, in a in a health center, um, the owner wants uh, to give the electricity for free to the doctors and they want to charge a small fee to the employees, but they want to charge a market rate to the passerbys, so somebody who is just in the area and they just want to charge the car. Technology answers to that also, and we can do that. We can do different rates depending on what is the um, depending on what is the use of, of of depending on what is the what is the user, right? And finally, we have a lot of um, capacity to um, allocate because we are technology providers and the technology is developed in-house we are not subcontracting anything um, apart from the charging station um, then we integrate all the technology into that charging station and the technology belongs to us so we have the freedom and we have the flexibility i would say to to uh, develop ad hoc solutions like valet 
sometimes we have valet teams that they are in the second floor and the parking space is the minus two, uh, two levels below. So we have an app where the valet team could check if the charging station has finished charging or not yet, right? So, so again, technology can charge, can, can, can support almost every question that you can uh, imagine in the um, in the uh, uh, along the along the route of the uh, electrification as an amenity, right? So the concluding um, remarks is, how do I start, right? So the first question you need to think about is what do you want to do with the with the rate? Do you want to um, do you want to charge or do you want to give that for free, right? So why is that? Because any business model is fooled with the charging rate, right? So if you want to give an amenity for free, then you will have no other choice. You will have to pay for the charging station, and that's perfectly okay. But but that's a little bit of what you are what you have to think about. Um, before you start, do you want to give an amenity? It's not as much as what happens with the money, but it's also what is your objective? There's some people who call us and they say, yeah, we have a big, huge property, a rental short-term property, but we just want to make sure that in internet, we can say that there are charging stations, right? And the property is huge and, and people who are on the edge of the property will never use it because they have to walk like 10, 15 minutes but at least the owner is able to say in the web page that they have that charging station because more and more people, when they call, they ask in hotels, in, a, in a, uh, hospitality, they ask if there are uh, charging stations or not in the residence, right? So, so to have the objective of what you want to do, do you want just to be known as someone who has a charging station because that gives you value, that gives value to your service? Do you want to make revenue? Um, and that's another story. Or you really want to give an amenity. And in that case, you have to provide a good service. And I would say that that's, 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 the, most, that's the most clear uh, picture that, that you need to have before entering into that project, because that's going to drive the type of charger, how many chargers, and how do we operate. All right? So that's question number one. Um, a corollary, um, a consequence of that question is, um, if you want to charge for electricity, how do you want to use that revenue? Um, do you want to use that revenue just to cover the cost or you want to make some money, right? And that's also going to be a big driver because if your objective is to make money, the charging stations have to be different, right? In that aspect, it's important that you talk to somebody who is advising on the system rather than selling you the charging station and, 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 and running away, right? Um, so to know what are you going to do with the, um, with the revenue is very, very important. Um, there's something that is very particular to Florida, which is the seasonality, right? Um, so how many non-seasonal EV drivers you have today? Um, when we have our first conversation, that's going to be the first question I'm going to ask you. How many drivers in your business or in your property, you estimate if it's a business or in your property, you know that there are, and that's going to that's gonna give us a good estimate of how do we have uh, to start. Do we have to start with two, with three? We will take a look at your electrical room and we will give you an advice on how, what is the best situation to start today, but also to, to do something that could grow with you. And that's that's also one of the challenges, right? So how we can install something that is not going to be good for you, but obsolete in two years, right? Um, so so yeah, how many permanent or what is going to be the use of that um, of that amenity in your case? And uh, and perhaps the most important thing is um, um, I like to see EV drivers almost like heroes um, because they are spearheading and they are taking a lot of risk um, when they decide to buy electric is because they, they, different, they have different motivations. A lot of people think that it's only cost of the, of the gas, but there's a lot of motivations. And, and those who are deciding to buy electric are going through um, a lot of uh, pain at the beginning. Um, but because they believe in something and they believe in something that is more, that is a little bit deeper 
Um, most of the cases, it's because of uh, they want to be they want to protect the environment. In some other cases, it's because they have an experience, they have a different driving experience. Um, I always say an electric car is not just another type of car; it's a different um, experience um, down the road. What we need to do is to try to understand, even if for those that have decided that they will never or they think they will never drive electric, which is which is okay. And still, even if they haven't taken a decision, but they are driving gas, which is more than 90% or between 85 to 95% of the population today. So try to understand each other, right? Um, because that's the best way to make it happen um, when the decision drivers are different communities, um, um, which is the case in an office center, in a multifamily or um, in, a, in a business. So thank you very much. This is uh, um, the uh, end of the presentation. And um, I would like to um, invite uh, all of you, whoever has um, any, any question or doubt or, or who wants to discuss a little bit more, that's the time to do it. Thank you, Juan Carlos. Thank you so much, Peter. It's been very clarifying, Every, everything you mentioned today. I think we got a, a nice, uh, and a knowledge presentation about uh, electromobility. And now we are going to address those questions that you have. We have a few questions already. And if you have any other question, please type it in the tab that says questions in your control panel, which should be on the right side of your screen. And we'll take care of those in a moment. So first question that we have uh, today, Pere, uh, from Gabriel is, Saying very interesting, also also your website. Um, are you currently working with the installation of charging station based on solar? That's one. And the second uh, from Gabriel is: Do you have any presence in Latin America? Okay, so um, we the, the the quick answer is uh, no 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 to the first and and yes to the second right right. Um, so there's a lot of interest and there's growing interest um, um, from um, solar um, operators uh, in the market. Um, I would say that um, there is a beautiful opportunity to merge both worlds as much as there is an existing um, solar, um, solar infrastructure. Um, because what I want to say is that to create a, a solar infrastructure some people ask me, uh, could we do that with solar? Well, the answer is yes. But if you are only fitting with this, if you are only fitting the charging station from the solar, that's not going to be financially effective, right? So the solar cells, uh, the inverter, the battery. So in a nutshell, if you have a solar uh, installation, could we put charging stations connected to that solar infrastructure? That's easy, and the answer is yes, right? If you ask me, um, could we install charging stations with solar cells so that we reduce the consumption from the grid? The answer is easy, is it doesn't make sense, right? So, because it's, it, when we're talking about charging stations that are $3,000 or $4,000 or $5,000, um, we're talking about solar installations that are much more um, expensive. So if you have an existing solar um, installation, yes, we could plug and, and we are agnostic as to whether the energy comes from one source or from another, but don't, don't take the route of installing a new uh, solar cell installation just for the charging stations. And as for the second question, yes, um, we have um, an office in, uh, um, in Chile and we have also some activity in Medellin, Colombia. Wonderful. Uh, thank you, Peter. Uh, more questions. Are there state or federal subsidies to install EV charging in condos? Right. The, the quick answer is uh, subsidies. As a general answer, um, subsidies exist, but only when we are open to open that charging station to the public. All right. That's the general question, uh, the general answer. So, so if you are open, which it's never the case, right? Condos do not want to open that um, installation to the public. But if you are open to 
if you're open to do that, then there could be some, some uh, tax credits. At the moment, there are no subsidies. Um, there are tax credits. And always the condition is that you have to be open to have that charging station used by anybody in the open market, in the public space, which isn't, I mean, it's hardly ever the case because 90, I would say, majority of the condominiums are gated and there is no, um, there is no possibility to, uh, to uh, open it to the public. Thank you. Um, next question. Pablo asks us, what is the revenue generated by uh, an EV charging station average? <laughs> this is very, very, very wide and it's a great question. Um, so today, um, average use of a charging station on the first year of installation, it could be between one to five hours. Um, it's going to be starting in a residence, uh, depends on the use, right? The gas station is going to be a little bit higher. Um, in a residence, it's going to be a little bit lower. But I would say that a lot of stations are below five hours per day. Um, if you are talking about level two charging stations, which is the ones that we are installing in residences, um, uh, the revenue is, is going to be approximately between three to five dollars per hour. Um, and if we're talking about level three charging stations, it's going to be about 15 to 20 dollars per hour. Right. So, um, so, so that's, that's a very big wide margin of, uh, of order of magnitude. It's around $5 per hour for a level two and about 15 to $20 per hour on a level three. But I always, I also say, I also tell my clients that this is not, a, there is a lot of competition on, uh, energy prices. Um, because what I told you is the revenue, that's the gross. We have to deduct the energy cost, which is about one third. Um, and then we have to deduct, obviously, the general administration cost, et cetera, et cetera. So as a business, it makes sense only when you have a lot of volume, I would say, right? Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, another question, it's um, how can we be sure that this solution decided today for our condo is not obsolete in a couple of years. This is a this is an absolute great question, and I'm 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 uh, it's it's the first the first time that I will clearly put the hat of City Vitae here, and not only uh, an agnostic um, speaker um, trying to give some information. Um, the problem. Um, Sorry, can you hear me? Yes. So the problem we have uh, today is that a lot of people are in the transactional part of the business. And, um, and this transactional part of the business is, uh, sorry, yeah, here I am. So a lot of people are in the transactional part of the business and um, what they care is about selling the charging station. I would say that almost pretty much every operator, every charge point operator is looking at selling charging stations. And as I said, we are not doing that. We, are by, we, are, we have a byproduct which is to sell the charging station, but we spend a lot of time and a lot of resources in giving an advice um, to how to tackle the project today and that the project is good for the future. So we have, um, I'm gonna give you just a, an idea that um, Eighty percent of our core team are transportation engineers, so we have a capacity to model. So today, if you give me, if you give us a geolocalization, um, we are able to tell you with a with a lot of with a with a with a lot of prediction capacity what's going to be the demand in that location for the next coming ten years, right? So the first thing we are going to do is when you go to your office, to your residence, to your business is we are going to put that address in our models and we are going to tell you how that location is going to grow. And we take into account what is the use, how many charging stations and what are the charging stations in the area. And after that, uh, we tell you what's the solution for today and how is going to be the solution for tomorrow. So that's the one part of the answer in terms of growth, right? Now, the second part of the answer of the question is technological obsolescence, right? Now, there is no sign, I'm, I'm very cautious always here, um, but the reality is that there is no sign today 
that there's going to be a breakthrough in how we move the electricity from point A to point B, right? Um, we have powered trains for 40 years. Ele trains are electric, and we know that technology, there is nothing new. Let me tell you, there is nothing new in the way we are feeding power into a car. That is something that we know from donkey's ears, right? The only thing that is changing very rapidly is the capacity of the battery. The density of the battery is is changing a lot, is, is, is increasing a lot, but not the way we are transmitting the energy. In other words, today there is no sign that the basic way where we move the electrons from point A to point B is going to change. And, and the only thing that could change a little bit is the onboard converter. Um, but I tell my clients, if I install a 60, a 60 amp uh, charging station today, what could happen is that in five or six years, instead of 60 amp, you would install 100 amps, uh, the additional uh, charging station, but there are technical limitations. You're not going to go much farther than that, right? So in a nutshell, answering that question, there's nothing that could create obsolescence in the horizon for the next coming few years. And when I say few, I say five or six or seven. Hydrogen is not going to be cost effective um, in the next coming 10 years um, in the overall uh, passenger market. And where we are going to see a big change is in the capacity of the battery. Today, you can run about 200 miles. That capacity is going to be overpassed to 500 miles very, very fast with the technology that's called solid state batteries. Thank you. Thank you, Pere. Um, another question that, that we have here is um, the charging station is just the last piece of the puzzle of the system, but um, are all charging stations able to charge every vehicle or we need to choose between different types of charging stations depending on the vehicle that we need to charge? I would say, and, and, and again, this is a great question. It, it, it says a lot about the audience and the fact that they are very involved in uh, what we have said. So thank you very much. Um, there is there is a great there is a great standardization level. It's not perfect, but it's great, right? I think that we in our in our in our history we have seen examples of much poor um, situations where um, the standardization has been much much worse. So. In a nutshell, the level two charging stations have only one connector. That's called J1772. Regardless who is using and what they are doing, everybody uses the J1772 except Tesla that is using the NA, NACS, right? But there is an adapter to go from J1772 to NACS, and that adapter costs $40. So for level two, all Tesla drivers have a small adapter that costs $40 in the Tesla page that makes them available to all the level two charging stations, regardless of what is the brand, because we are all using J1772 connector. It is the only that has been certified for alternate current in US apart from the NACS connector. So level two, we have J1772 for everyone except Tesla, and there is an adapter that costs $40, which is very affordable. For level three, situation is a little bit more complex. We, until very recently, we had two standards, what we call the CCS. So, sorry, for level two, I consider that standard, right? So the fact that you have to use one adapter from one to the other, that's a very minor issue. And I consider that totally standard. For the level three, there are two connectors, the CCS1, which has an equivalent in Europe, not compatible equivalent in Europe, uh, that's called CCS2. The CCS1 in in, um, in US, and we used to have another one that is called Charemo, that used to be the one uh, used by Mitsubishi, Toyota, and all the Japanese brands, but and Nissan, but this has been discontinued by Nissan. So very recently, we will not see any more Charemo in the, in the state. In any case, um, nobody, no car is mounting the Charemo connector, so that it's out of the story. It's the only, there's only one car, Mitsubishi a Highlander, that is mounting 
um, a Chademo, but it's a hybrid car. So I would consider Chademo out of the picture, right? So then there is two standards, CCS1 and Tesla, right? So if you buy a non-Tesla car, you will have a CCS, like the Porsche Taycan, for instance. And then um, if you buy a Tesla, you will have the NACS, right? Again, there is an adapter to go from one to the other, which in this case is a little bit more costly. It's about $80, $90, but it works perfectly well. Technically, there were no challenges. There used to be a very bulky, very expensive adapter to go from CCS to NACS, Tesla, but Tesla has released a very affordable adapter, and that was very recent in March 23. And this adapter, you can buy it uh, wide label or you can buy it in the web page from Tesla and it's again it's a little bit more expensive it's about $80 but I would also consider that being uh, being a standard right so in a nutshell level two um, with an adapter of $40 everybody is a standard with only two connectors and level uh, three Tesla or non Tesla and there is also an adapter to go from one to the other Thank you so much, Peter. Thank you. Um, and we have one more question, and it's 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 kind of a more strategic question. Let's put it that way. So, you are aware of the growth of the EV cars adoption, and you have the data that provides the um, well what you expect for the next coming years. The question is, uh, do you think that if that data at the end of the day match with the reality, the transportation infrastructure is gonna be ready for that or that's gonna be behind the adoption of the EV vehicle and the charging stations needed to provide those charges? You mean the transportation, um, I'm not sure to understand. The transportation mean the grid? The transportation the grid, of yeah. electricity? Uh, yeah, I, I believe that it's the grid. About, you know, the grid that comes from the okay. high voltage and then goes to, to the lower voltage. Okay, there, there's no sign today that, so the, all the grid is, um, is, 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 is capable, is over dimension. So the first thing is that the grid is over dimension today and the grid is adapting, all right? Um, and the grid is adapting at a very fast pace also. Um, we are very far away, as we said during the presentation, to have 250 million batteries running all over the country, which is, which is not the case. It's not gonna be the case anytime soon, right? But what's gonna happen is that that's going to, it's, what it's going to create is not a problem of capacity, is a problem of punctual demand. So there are going to be peaks that are going to be very uncomfortable to handle by the grid. We see that in the profile, in our profile of usage, we see that from 5 to 8 p.m., that's where most of the usage is being produced. So during that time, the grid has to prepare to cope for that punctual additional demand of energy. And there's a lot of things going on in that aspect, and that's called vehicle to grid, V as in Victor, number two, and G as in, as in grid. Vehicle to grid is the technology that will allow for the cars not only to receive energy from the grid, but to inject energy from the grid. In the solar market, that's called, that, that has different names depending on the country, but that exists already. So we can install solar cells in our house and we have the capacity to decide if the energy that we generate, we, we inject to the grid or not. So all the utility companies will work, and in fact, there are already technologies proven of vehicle to grid, where when I arrive at home, if my car is at 80% battery level, I'm not only not going to charge, but I'm going to inject into the grid. And the rest is going to be handled by a tariff, by a system of revenue generation and tarification. So imagine, in other words, that FPL requires some energy between six to eight in Miami. So what they're going to do is that they are going to pay us, EV drivers, a lot of money to inject electricity into the grid through that system that it's called vehicle to grid. So 
yes, there's going to be a little bit of a challenge during certain hours, but it's not going to be a global demand issue. It's going to be a peak. Um, it's going to be a peak demand issue. And that peak demand issue, there's a lot of people already, and we are working on having a solution also adapted to uh, vehicle to grid, which is going to be injecting energy to the grid to balance out those uh, irregularities that will be uh, produced in the system due to the grow, uh, growing adoption of uh, electric vehicles. Thank you so much, Pere. Well, um, there's no more questions so far. It's 12.01, so uh, we ended it on time. Uh, I would like to thank again, Pere, for being with us today. Thank you. You presented us with a real clear picture of electromobility. And we would like to thank all our attendees for um, being with us today and learn from CDBDI about these technologies. Uh, as we said at the beginning, we will share this presentation and also the video to all the attendees, but you are also able to, to watch it in our YouTube channel and share with friends, family, and business partners that might be interested in the topic. Also, uh, Pere information, it's in the screen. You can see that his email, telephone number, and we will also share that information via email with all of you uh, if you would like to continue the conversation with him directly. Again, for joining the Spain US Chamber of Commerce, we hope to see you again in our new uh, webinar or uh, in person event. So have a great day and enjoy the, this coming soon weekend. Okay. So goodbye and thank you so much, Pere. Thank you. Everybody. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you.